Do you want to learn how to improve your endurance on the trumpet? In this video, we're going to share real life experiences and tips to help you reach your goals. My name is Chris Davis. Welcome to a channel that I call Trumpet Lessons HQ, where I give you tips, demonstrations, and encouragement to help you become a better trumpet player faster. If you like the sound of that, go ahead and press the subscribe button below. Thanks a lot. The theme for this month is endurance. And we're going to do that by releasing videos. A new video went out yesterday on the topic of endurance. Today, we have a live interview on the topic of endurance. And in two weeks, you can attend the practice live workshop. And the topic is about endurance. If you don't know, if you don't know about practice live, that's an opportunity for you to come practice live with me. It's a workshop. I'll do some teaching. And you also get to meet other trumpet players in the community trumpet lessons hq community so if you like the sound of that the link is in the description below and i'll see you there in two weeks now one more thing before we get into the the content i want you to write your questions in the comment section even right now and uh, throughout the interview because we're going to have a live q a and i want to make sure that we get every question answered all right and i don't want to wait to the last minute so, with all that said, I would like to introduce you to today's guest. I'm very excited to have this gentleman on. He's somebody that I've known for nearly 20 years already. Time really flies. Um, <laughs> he's the leader of the Chicago Trumpet Summit. He's a former member of the Count Basie Orchestra. And right now he has a new album, his debut album, with his quintet. The, uh, the name of the album is called The Ancestors Call. And you can purchase it in April, April 16th to be exact. It's my pleasure to introduce to you right now Mr. Marcus Carroll. Marcus, welcome to the show. Glad to have you today. What's going on, Chris, man? Uh, 20 years, wow. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it, but time really does fly. Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, you know, today's topic is about endurance. And uh, I've told people a little bit about you Um and I just want to really cut into the meat of the content, guys, because I know how YouTube is. I know you'll leave if we're not teaching, and it's important to me to teach. So, uh, Marcus, knowing that today's topic is about endurance, and uh, I know you personally, and I know that you've had a serious injury to your chops, and um, I know that can affect your endurance. So will you tell us what happened there with that injury? What was the injury, first of all, and how did it happen? Yeah, Chris, I, well, I'll be just really explicit. I've been through several different uh, amateur in injuries. Um, my first one dating back to college. Uh, I was playing on really, really big equipment. I was uh, I came up from the old school drum and bugle corps uh, idea of got to play loud, use a lot of wind, that mentality. Uh, with that, I was playing on some really big equipment. And then I, I did a shift of equipment change to smaller equipment with the same force uh and one day i was warming up and uh i went up above the staff and i felt a split and it wasn't a uh it wasn't a vertical split it was a horizontal split and it it literally was on the inside of the lip where i anytime i tried to form an amateur and play my lip gave out i had to take literally i think three months off of playing the trumpet uh and i was also kind of anxious because i was like man i'm in my sophomore year of college if this is happening now will i make it as a professional uh all of those things uh after that happened i came back to the horn I, actually what i started doing was picking up more piano playing and and just <laughs> learning other things you know uh, but when I came back to the horn, I came back really slowly with a lot of mouthpiece buzzing, a lot of free buzzing. Uh, I started really diving into the Maggio method, uh, which is a great, great book, uh, working on learning to kind of get this pucker together. Uh, and within in that time of college, I developed my own concept about the three F's, firm corners, uh, flat, firm chin, and fast wind. I stopped using the idea about air and started thinking about wind motion. And because air is a very stagnant thing, it's just sitting. But as soon as we put things into motion, things start happening. So I had to start to learn to bring these lips a little bit more forward and keep them very flexible. I talked to somebody the other day and they were talking about the, the center here being firm. 
You don't want that to be firm. You actually want that to be flexible because when it is flexible, this center here where the aperture is, you're able to get a lot more vibration. And that's what we're talking about. The more lip that you get into the cup, the more vibration that you're getting into that cup, the more that, for me, the meatier and thicker the sound I'm starting to get. Now, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, and so as I move through that piece, the lip split again <laughs> as I was playing outside of college. I, you know, I spent 10 years before I went back and got a master's degree. So understand this, that I'm trying to play gigs and work as a professional trumpet player on a, like on a bum lip, like walking around with a crutch all day. <laughs> uh, so I, I literally took about a couple of years and I will have to say my transition happened because of great trumpet player, Brent Turney. Brent Turney is, a, is an amazing trumpet player who got me thinking about how I was rolling the lips. So then I started working on, if this is the top lip, bottom lip, I started going, just working on getting point of contact. As soon as I did that, my sound was, uh, it was different. There was, it, I didn't have this, this uh, warm, fluffy thing that I was accustomed to having. It was a more direct focus sound. So it took me some years to even work a routine to get that underway. Um, now you fast forward, you know, 10 years of playing in Chicago, shows, weddings, corporate work, jazz gigs, touring, uh, and then falling out of the routine of things, right? You're playing. So having a stick into a routine is going to be challenging at times uh, to the point that, you know, not warming up, not warming down. All of those things that athletes do, right? You know, as soon as I – so when I toured, the, the, what, I, what happened for me here was – I actually had a pulled muscle in this top part of the lip. I started seeing bruising in areas after playing. And I was like, man, this doesn't feel good. Um, I contacted Dr. Uh, McGrail, uh, who has done, you know, lip surgery for, for brass players. Uh, I talked to several different people who actually talked to Dr. McGrail. I wasn't going to go through surgery, but I started working on exercises. I, I got through Lucinda Lewis's, I think her book, Broken Ambushers, which is a great book. Uh, I started doing the McGrill exercises. Uh, the PEAT, uh, if you ever use that device, is a great device. I just got back to some really core basics, man. Um, and it was at that time of that torn lip is when the Basie Orchestra called me and I did not want to turn that gig down just because of a pulled muscle, you know. <laughs> So I literally spent three months really shaping, getting this thing back into shape. Uh, and it's a constant struggle, man. I think once you pull a muscle, it's never the same. I'm also 40, going on 43. I'm not 20 anymore. So that also has a lot to do with, you know, just the muscle muscle change that I never thought about when I was a younger player. Um, a lot of things, actually, as you're getting older, <laughs> you know, um, how you play the horn, how you approach your, your routine, uh, the things you need to practice on as just a trumpet player from range to flexibility, all those things. So um, that that's the extent of what I went through. I, if you want to ask me more, I can definitely tell you more about uh, those exercises that I was doing to get it together. But it's uh, it's not an easy thing and it's not to be taken lightly when you injure yourself. you got to actually treat yourself like an athlete. If, and if, if a football player... Well, looking like, uh, who was it, uh, Kevin Durant, right? Pulled his Achilles during the, the Warriors, and he was out, right, for an entire next season with the Nets, right? Like, you're not coming back. you you got to take time off. And that's a scary thing, uh, especially when your livelihood can be, man, I, I make money. <laughs> I make a living doing this, right? Uh, so how am I going to do that if I can't, you know? Yeah. Man, you touched on so many <laughs> important topics that <laughs> – we can't talk about all of those things. Um, let's, man, let's talk about <laughs> prevention because here's the thing I, I learned about injuries. Um, they generally happen when we are just too focused on completing whatever, working, um, and we don't take the time to do the things we should have done anyway. So you get injured, and now you have no choice <laughs> but to sit down and be still and, and do things methodically. So um, what are some things, I guess, that we should just be doing anyway to prevent injury 
in your opinion? Yeah, man. yeah. So I, my, I've got a. I'm working actually on an ebook right now of this specific topic. It's crazy that you actually called me to do this because I'm like in the midst of trying to wrap this book up because I talk a lot about this. Um, and it's literally you have to as a instrumentalist, but especially a trumpet player, man. This is a one of the most difficult instruments to play. You know, you got three valves, mouthpiece, you got to <laughs> make it all work. Even on a day that you're not feeling great, you got to make sure that it's, it's locked in. So make sure as a trumpet player that you have a routine that fits for you. You know, your routine fits for you. Nobody, you know, you can take bits and pieces of somebody else's routine. But the foundation of my routine, the first thing that I do, honestly, is I actually meditate in the morning. So, and I know that might sound crazy the most, but for me, meditation is a huge component of relaxation. Uh, what I noticed that in my playing was that there was a lot of tension, you know, like trying to muscle the trumpet. And there's no muscling. You're not going to win trying to battle the trumpet. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, so part of that foundation is the meditation up front, whether that's 15 minutes to 20 minutes, depending on what my time is. That gets me in the right headspace, but when I go into actual playing, it's always free buzzing first, so I'm working on wind flow. And I time out to about two to five minutes. I don't do anything too longer than that. It's like stretching, right? I get into then actual mouthpiece buzzing with the burp. And my goal with that is that no matter wherever that note is, sound-wise, volume-wise, that is like literally, if I can demonstrate, this, this is where I'm at, right? I'm going to work on that sound for the next two to five minutes and move around that mouthpiece. Different dynamics. Just try to get the completeness of waking up this muscle, right? From there, I'm going to then jump into playing long tones. And long tones for most folks could be flow study, chick I use stamps, but I've also made up my own. Uh, the goal with that is to make sure that there that's a two to five minute routine where I'm working on just getting sound together, some flexibility as well. I'll then jump into, and it could be as simple as this, you know. Mm -hmm. really focus on win, right? The next thing I do is I go into some form of lip, lip flexibilities. And I don't actually, I shouldn't even call them lip flexibilities because it's the tongue that's doing the work. You know, one, I had to start changing up the, the wording that I was using because it affected me. When I think lip slurs, you're thinking here, which makes muscles work twice as hard. When you think of it as a tongue slur, like you're whistling, when you whistle, this, this component right here stays the same. It's the tongue that's actually altering the pitch, right? So when we do tongue slurs, this is staying the same right in here while the tongue is on the inside doing what it needs to do to help alter that pitch. So I really focus on a lot of that, that wind movement and tongue movement in the slur aspect. Uh, and then I spend the next two to five minutes on some type of tonguing exercise um, I try to bring everything inward, Chris, where it's like I'm encompassing all of, you know, range, technique, all of that within that in that routine. Right. And that routine for me could be anywhere from, you know, a half an hour to 45 minutes. That's not a warm up. It's just my foundation routine, because the rest of the day as I'm doing, I've got a lot that I'm doing. I don't really touch the horn all day. I have bits and pieces where it's like, here's a 15 minute window that I schedule that I'm playing an A2. Right. And then I go about doing meetings, other work that I have to get done, writing a chart, you know, creating. Then I've got another 20 minutes here. Now I'm working on this tune that, you know, that, uh, that I've been wanting to work on. Right. And this harmony and being able to, you know, so it's a breakup. If what I've learned in rebuilding for especially endurance is short amount of time with more focus actually yields me more reward than trying to beat the trumpet in my face for two, three hours. It's not productive. And you're prone to prone to injuring yourself if you're trying to like, man, I gotta get this together, I gotta get this together. It's not gonna trust me. You can practice five hours a day, it's still not gonna come together. Or you can practice 15 minutes with some serious focus, put it down, 
think about it, record myself. I, I do a lot of recording to actually hear, but also visually see what I'm doing as well. So I know it's a lot of information. No, it's perfect though. That's that's the process, and uh, that's what we need to do. And the good thing to know is that it's a process. So um, thanks for those yeah. tips, man. It's very helpful. Um, let's talk about one more thing, and then we'll we'll open up the questions. Um, you said something important at the beginning of your story, and so I want to ask how how uh, much does equipment matter? Ooh, good, good question. question. How, how much, much does it matter to you? We're, we're, talk, <laughs> we're talking about endurance, though. So we're thinking still about our yeah. endurance. You know, yeah, how, how much I does think, equipment matter? Yeah, I, I think um, it matters to for comfortability. To be perfectly honest. I, you know, like it's funny, like you play, you got an Edwards, right? Yeah. And that works great for you, man. And I remember when I played, I was like, man, this thing is way too open for me. You know, like I needed a little bit more resistance. I think for every trumpet player, and especially as you study with different teachers, your teach every teacher is not going to play on the same horn. You know, <laughs> so and I don't think it's a good idea for a teacher to say you have to have this horn. I think you know as you're learning that you try to find that piece of equipment that works best for you. For me, I need something that has some openness with a slight resistance on it. Uh, I've always been prone to playing bigger mouthpieces. Uh, I think where I ran into a problem with uh, equipment was when I wanted to start working on my lead trumpet playing in upper register, I immediately started playing on smaller mouthpieces. Bad idea. Bad idea. Uh, what I learned from that uh which was actually through injury, was that it takes a certain type of role to get into those smaller mouthpieces. You actually limit yourself in flexibility and and sound. And for me, it's always been about sound. So uh, as, as I play on equipment, I try to find stuff that feels easy as I flow through it. You know what I mean? Um, I've played on a box Strad 37 pretty much all my life. I, I always make sure I have a good one, and I've always played on a one and a half. Sometimes I'm one and a quarter if I want to go a little bit bigger. When I play lead, it's probably as small as a 3C now. Um, you know, I've, I've figured out that it's about wind. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it, you know what I mean? And that's a – I took a four-hour lesson with B. John Watson one time, and we just – we seriously sat there and worked on wind. And it didn't make sense until maybe a couple of years after the fact, honestly. Uh, when you have control of your wind – uh, and how you move it forward and not thinking of upward and downward when it comes to range and things like that. Not only is your endurance increasing uh, because you're not muscling things, you're actually letting the wind do the work. Yes. When the wind, when the wind does the work and you go up and you play in that upper register of your horn flawlessly with ease, there's going to be a light bulb that goes off. You're going to be like, oh, crap, it happened. And then you're going to try to recreate it and then you're going to tighten up again. It takes – It's a pro as Chris just said, it's a process – that you have to continue to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Not like, oh, I did it a couple of days and then I took off. No, it is like, for especially young trumpet players or folks getting back into this, you must remember to do this on a daily basis. And it's not a lot of time. Allow 10 to 15 minutes of just working on wind flow. You yes. know what I'm saying? Going yes. up scales and like one way to practice a scale with this wind flow to build up endurance, start from the top and go down and then come back up instead of from the bottom, right? Yeah. You get this real easy flow as opposed to starting from the bottom. You've got a running start now. Your wind is actually moving quickly like a roller coaster. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. I love it. Man, you're giving us so much valuable information. I call it the right guy. <laughs> um, let's open it up to questions. I have um, a very important question here that just came in. Uh-oh. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. This is from Dan Cam. My mustache is currently too long, <laughs> and it bothers my armature seal. <laughs> Does a long mustache interfere with your armature? <laughs> this is Dan. Dan, I'm yes, going to tell you right now, man, I have never met a trumpet player that that kept a really thick mustache. And the ones that they that I have seen, if it, it, it affects – you got to remember, man, listen – the top, the top lip and the bottom lip have to come together to make sound. And when that mouthpiece rests, it needs to rest on this flesh. 
Now, I've seen people with mustaches where they actually kind of carve out a little space. You know what I'm saying? That's that's how much they love their mustache. But when that mouthpiece rests on the mustache, you got to remember you're not getting full contact with this top lip. Now, you know, and because that's the seal, that mouthpiece seals all of this area right here to vibrate. Yes. And if you are not sealing that, then it affects it not only affects your wind, it affects your flexibility. It's going to affect your tone and your sound. You know what I'm saying? Your articulation, yes. like all of those things are affected. Then you get frustrated and then you're like, why am I playing? Right. So you yeah. got to, you know, if it's a sacrifice, if the mustache is your thing and it makes you look, it makes you feel great. I, I don't know what else to tell you, but I would I would honestly probably trim it down. You know, I keep a very thin, you know, a ghost of a mustache, man. Chris as well. Like you don't you want to make sure that top lip is exposed to get into that cup. That's good. Good yeah. advice, man. I'm glad you answered that question instead of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's see here. All right. OK, the question here is from Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Have either one of you played in a symphonic orchestra? I'm having trouble. I keep losing my place when I play with the band. Mm. So, yeah, I, I'm going to tell you, I was actually more classically trained uh, when I first started playing trumpet. Uh, I studied with Dan Presgrave and Jim Bovinette in St. Louis, but also with Susan Slaughter, who was principal of the St. Louis Symphony. Uh, I spent a lot of my early part of my career uh, in wind ensembles and orchestras, loved it. Uh, and it is hard when you're playing in, in a, an orchestra and sometimes, especially for brass trumpet players, we have to sit there for about 100 measures before we actually play something. So my advice is this, first off, as a professional, always make sure you have several different pencils with you, all right? And not dark pencils, something that you can like lightly give yourself cues. Uh, when I worked in orchestra pits, I would have actually colored pencils to give myself cues in my music so I knew exactly where certain things were. Uh, if you're getting lost, you might want to write indicators in, because the chart is a blueprint. So think of it that way, all right? And as you're following along, write in uh, woodwinds are playing here or uh, the strings take over here or, you know, section up those measures that you might be having problems in uh, as far as counting, because to me, that's a counting. That's a counting thing. If you're getting lost or, you know, you're not focused with what's happening with your part as uh, that goes along with all the other parts. You really got to know the music. I think uh, one thing that also will help is if you actually got a recording of the music and really sat down and studied your part with uh, a professional ensemble playing it so you can see how your part lays with the rest of the music. It's real easy to get lost in performance with a group of people because you're enjoying it, yeah. you know, or you're bored. Right. <laughs> so you got to, you know what I mean? You got to check yourself as a professional because that's your, that's what you signed up for. It's, your, it's, it's a job. You really have to, and it's enjoyment, but it's a job. And your role on the team is to be able to play your part in time with in sync with everybody else. And when it's not, you've got to check on that, okay? So I would definitely write cues in for myself to to know where I'm at. Thanks, Marcus. We got a question from the King. Hello, Marcus. I was always told to start my warm up on the low C, then go up mm. the scale. What's the best first mm. note to start on the trumpet after buzzing, of course? Yeah. Uh, Everybody, this is this is so funny. This is why it's so great to talk about this because yeah. every teacher is different. Every teacher is different. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I do. And I said it earlier, though, for me, middle G is the number one note for me. It is a note uh, for I struggle with playing in the lower register because my muscle is still weak. Right. So for me, playing middle G, the muscle is engaged immediately. It's not something where I have to literally like if I was to play middle C, I got to kind of work. I don't have to work for that note, but there's a process there. But when I bring the horn to my face, the first notes of the day for me is sorry for the spit. But that G, that middle G is so evident, just like it's it's there. I don't have to work for it. It's full. It's strong. And for me, I want to make sure that I move around that note and expand my range because as I expand my range, I have to use my wind to expand, right? Yes. Right? Or yeah. whatever note 
I should think to the E. But when I stay on that middle G and I expand going upward and downward, I will then gauge how my face is feeling for me to go right. further to the upper register or further to the lower register. Because as soon as I start to have to work for it, I know that I need to not only take a break, you know, yes. physically, but also mentally. Good point. Listen to your body. That's one of my tips. You know, and yeah. Marcus said this earlier. Uh, don't force things. Uh, and again, we're talking about endurance. So, you know, once you start to, to feel signs of fatigue coming along, cut it out. You know, you'll come back to it later. Yeah. Um, yeah you, I, I want to add to that. Don't don't treat it like uh, if you're in the gym. You know, I always equate gym and trumpet playing together, like working out. Yes. When you're in the gym, you're like, ah, get one more. No, no, exactly. no. You're going to pull something, you know. So know your know your limitations. And the thing with endurance is this. Endurance is built up in short spurts. It's like running sprints. Right. Endurance is built up in these short spurts. It's not about how long I can keep the horn on my face, but it is how long do I keep this engaged? Right. How long is this this firmness is engaged? How long is my core of my where the, the wind is moving is engaged, right? Yes. Do I feel not a weakness, but a strength and a burning feeling. And then as you feel that, like any other muscle, you know you're building up endurance. And then you add on a little bit extra. One other thing I'll say, Chris, before you go to the next question is this. I also practice with, you know, with a metronome when I do this stuff. And I make sure that that metronome is slow. The slower that you play, the more endurance you will build up as well. When you have to actually play and engage that muscle, it takes more work to go and it's boring. I get it. It can be boring, but that's effective playing when you move things slower than you want to. That's a great tip as well. Um, we have another question here from, oh gosh, it's not a hard name. <laughs> But I, I don't know if I can read. <laughs> but there is. Uh, he says, or she, I think that's the guy's name. How do you approach learning new tunes for beginners? Oh, wait, before we answer that question, hold on, Marcus. Um, Marcus Marcus said something about uh, training your body as an athlete would. And that's something that I talked about in the video that was released yesterday. If you haven't checked it out already, go ahead and check it out. Uh, some good tips in that video. And Marcus has said a lot of the things that I was talking about in that video. We, we didn't we didn't uh, have a meeting before we before now. I, I, but this is how I, you I play the horn. I didn't even I didn't even know that you even you put that out because yeah. I'm I'm gonna tell you, man. What I've what I've learned in this experience as I'm gotten older, age will do it to you. Yes, You'll sir. realize, like, man, I can't play the same way. I and I definitely can't approach the horn the same way. So. As you age, so this is for young players that watch this, trust me, life is going to keep moving by quickly. And as it does to play this instrument, you need to adjust as you get older as well. But I think if your foundation is strong, you shouldn't have a problem. But you've got to think how an athlete does. You know what I'm saying? Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, wasn't dunking on folks too much when he was as he got older. He did it when his ego got the best of him. But he went to what? The turnaround fadeaway jumper. That's you know, true. that was his thing. Kobe Bryant did the same thing. It's like I'm getting a little older, right? And, and along the same line of thinking, standing with the NBA athlete analogy, man, look at LeBron James. He's yep. he's almost 20 years in. Yesterday he, he dunked and he almost hit his neck on the rim because from the beginning he paid attention to taking care of his body. You know, yep. so it's the same, same, same concept. All right, yes, going I, on to the to the next question from Matthias. How do you approach learning new tunes for beginners? It's hard for me to learn solos that I love because there's always one note that I can't hit yet. I'm I'm mm. currently trying to practice melodies. Yeah. I'm going to tell you this, uh you know, the the best advice I'll give is learn the music by ear. Number 1. If there's a tune that you enjoy, find the, you know, the the, the artist that you like that plays it, you know, because there's going to be so many different renditions of like stable mates or, 
you know, all the things you are, right? These standard songs that we tend to want to learn as part of our history, in, at least in, I'm going to speak in jazz music, right? Black American music, right? So when we talk about this, like finding the person that you enjoy the most is important because you want to be able to listen to this day in and day out. I think you need to be able to sing the song first and then start to play it on the instrument. If you can't sing it, you can't play it. And that's the same thing with solos. If you have an idea in your mind and you can't sing it or are not willing to sing what you want to play, it's not going to come out. Um, and as far as like the notes, I remember when I was working on Clifford Brown solos when I was in high school and Clifford would get up to like playing, you know, E's and F's coming off of his solos. Yeah. I'm just like, man, I can't hit that yet. Yeah. <laughs> or this is difficult, right? But the feeling... And even when I would biff it, it was felt great because I'm like, at least I'm still in the game. Right. Yes. You want to get with with learning and transcribing solos. It's about finding the what I call the stank. Yeah, the, baby. The, the stank in music is what makes us tap our foot, makes us smile, makes us dance, makes us, you know, have we feel something. That's the difference between just kind of playing it and playing it with with that that oomph. And when you go for that note and you might miss it, it's OK, because we know that you felt something that's more than anything. Transcribing is learning to get the stank in your plan. Why does mm. because I'm going to tell you, everybody plays the note differently. I, if I ask Chris right now to play me four G's, the way I play four G's, and the way he plays is going to be completely different quarter notes. Right. Yeah. And so you yeah. have to figure out, man, what is my what is my stank? What is what's my DNA on this? Right. <laughs> That's right. So, That's true. So, so don't get preoccupied with I've got to hit his note. No, man. Look at the shape of the solo. Find the shape in that. That's that's really important, too. Um, and, and I'm not opposed to uh, I think you should transcribe it by ear, write it down. But I'm also not opposed to actually having a book of transcription books. We all have them. Uh, and, and I think that's another good way of actually building up endurance is taking a transcription and putting that metronome, not at the speed that the solo is at, but actually slowly. And like really, really play the mess out of it at like 60, 70. You know what I'm saying? And like really play that. Now that's confirmation, Clifford Brown. That, that's you playing that whole thing at that tempo. You're not only learning language, but you're building up your muscle here. You know, that's a, another good way that I've also incorporated because it gets boring practicing the same thing over and over again. So you've got to be creative in how you build up uh, these things. You know, like we're talking about this endurance thing, like how do I do that? You know, uh, I try to find as many A2 books and, and transcription books and just play them, especially slowly to work on technique and keeping the horn on my face, working on my wind, keeping the same sound, the same embouchure as I'm going through uh, different ranges as well. Yes, yes. Um, that's all good advice. I want to um, add a, my perspective because we have different perspectives. Yep. And um, real simple, for me, I always like to come to the fundamentals, guys. So if you're having a hard time reaching a note, uh, go back to basics. It's just as simple as that, you know. So uh, I think, for, I guess another question, another way to ask the same question would be how can I improve my range, right? Um, so I guess something. Yeah. yeah. Well, go ahead. You're our guest. Answer, go ahead. Answer that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the one, everything's a half step away. <laughs> That's right. Everything's a half step away. And I have a three strikes you're out rule when it comes to working on range. All right. So what I send my when my students start asking me, how do I play? I want to play higher notes. I'm like, you've got to actually think of that note being part of a phrase and an arc, number one. Right. But an exercise you can literally that I have students do that are able to play up, say, up to G really easily is that we just continue adding that half step up there actually with a flexibility at the top. You want to make sure that you just keep adding, you play from C to C diatonically to G, 
Do it again, but add a half step up to G sharp. And then do it again up to A. But you, the the trill in there is where, what's important because the trill can't happen without wind speed. And as I get to that top, I'm really trying to control volume and everything. That's an exercise that I've I've sent many students through that helped them with that range component. Yes. Because every week they would come back in, it would be more solid, more solid. It would take about a month for a student to get from, say, man, I'm struggling with A. And then we're at like actually a high C for them by the end of the month. Oh, you know, and that's and that's a huge I know it's a huge jump. But for those who did the work. When you add a when you look at this and see that you're going from G to G sharp, that's easy. When you see G to C, you're kind of like, Ugh, I don't know. So it's for me, it's a once again, it's a mental thing. If I can change up how I approach it, man, that half step movement is where it's at. You're diatonically moving through. You're getting wind speed going. You're getting flexibility going, and you're increasing range. Completely the over for me, that's the overall exercise. Man, beautiful advice. Thanks a lot, Marcus. We appreciate you for this. You know what? I want to take the time right now to I don't want to show you guys something. This is Marcus's album, The Ancestors Call. It's available in April, but there's a single coming in March. Marcus, what's the release date of that single? Yeah, so we already released the first single a couple of weeks ago uh, entitled Assemble the Enlightened. The second single comes out, it's called Aries Goddess for Consuela and the Fallen, and that comes out March 19th. The full record is out on all live streaming formats, or sorry, platforms, uh, April 16th. But you can go to my website, MarcusCarrollMusic.com, uh, and pre-order uh, the uh, a CD that will be mailed to you. You'll actually get it. You'll get this before anybody else. We've already, uh, we're doing pretty well right now. Man, that's beautiful. Uh, Put that back up. I want to see that again. I'm serious. That's, <laughs> that's a piece of art. The visual is a piece of art. And we're going to uh, hear my dad, the, wow. My, my dad's my graphic design artist, man. So he, he did some really great work, man. Um, but you can pre-order the record, man, and and go. You can also go to my Instagram or in my or my Facebook, but specifically on my Instagram page in the bio, there's a link to uh, everything to subscribe to the newsletter. To um, I'm doing some very similar things right now as I'm developing my YouTube channel, the same that that Chris is doing. Um, you know, just trying to get a lot of this knowledge out. We all uh, have different ways of approaching, but it's actually really similar. That's the messed up thing about it. It's just like, we're all talking about the same thing, but just different approaches. And every person is going to gravitate to somebody differently, which is why this is a really beautiful format. So Chris, thanks for having me, man. It's, a uh, it's good to watch your growth, man. 20 years. I remember the first time we met. So <laughs> yeah, that was a great, uh, memorable experience. And real quick, Cur <laughs> Curtis Taylor said, where's mine, bro? <laughs> oh curtis you always yeah. got sent out a while ago man and if it's not there yet then uh i'll have to check but i thought we sent yours out already my bad <laughs> right on right on right on hey this has been wonderful guys i want to say thank you for everyone to coming for coming today um this month is about endurance we have the video yesterday and today the interview with marcus thanks a lot marcus for sharing your wisdom with us and um in two weeks, practice live workshop with myself and every member of the Trumpet Lessons HQ community that registers. So if you want to register, the link is in the description below, and we'll see you at the next one. I appreciate you. God bless you. Take care.